Hello fellow history nerds and welcome to the Bold Historian Podcast. This is episode 5, Consolidation. So, we begin our episode with Hereward the Wake. So, the e-chronicle of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states Hereward and his gang were planning to plunder Peterborough Monastery. And as a side note, it's important to remember that the e-chronicle was actually written at Peterborough Monastery. The likely reason Hereward and his men decided to attack Peterborough Monastery was because it had recently been passed to a Norman abbot from an Anglo-Saxon abbot. And Hereward planned to attack the abbey before the new abbot arrived and took up office. Their motivation may have stemmed from the fact that the king plundered English churches and monasteries earlier that year, and the valuables that were kept at Peterborough were carried off by Hereward to the Danish camp at Ely as a way to protect them. And these treasures included vestments, crosses, money, books, shrines and altar fronts. And Hereward and his men were also tenants of the monastery. And this may provide a clue as to their loyalty to the treasures and the monastery itself. Following the attack on Peterborough, the city was reduced to ashes, and the English and Danish discussed holding Peterborough against the Normans. But when Abbot Turold arrived, the new abbot, he found the town was free of enemy forces. Turold arrived with a reputation as a ferocious man, and he was accompanied by 160 fully armed Frenchmen. For the English and Danish to vacate Peterborough in the face of 160 armed Frenchmen gives us a clue as to the state of the Danish army. The Danes arrived in England in 1069, and having to live off the land and being chased around England by King William and suffering a harsh winter must have taken its toll on the Danes. Starvation was a particularly staunch enemy and had caused many deaths. In addition, the harrying of the north by William and other areas further reduced the fighting effectiveness of the Danes. So it was clear William's strategy of harrying up in the north had achieved its goal, and that was to stop any enemy operating effectively within England. And as mentioned in the last episode, King Sven of Denmark arrived in England in 1070, and he quickly came to the conclusion that his army was a no-fit state to attempt to conquer England. At some point in June of that year, Sven accepted William's offer of peace and readily sailed back to Denmark. However, the journey was fraught with storms, which scattered the Danish fleet and the majority of loot and plunder was lost to the North Sea. And furthermore, Sven sent his brother Asbjorn into exile for accepting William's bribes whilst he was in command of the Danish army. So who knows what would have happened had Sven journeyed with his army in 1069. Sensing an end to the troubles in East Anglia, following the retreat of the Danes, William returned to Normandy. The neighbouring county of Flanders was in turmoil, and let's not forget William had married Judith of Flanders, and she was the daughter of Baldwin V, the former Count of Flanders. So William must have been comfortable enough to leave England, and as Orderic Vitalis states, by the grace of God, peace reigned over England, and a degree of serenity returned to its inhabitants. So. Had peace finally arrived in England after four bloody years of fighting? As it turns out, the answer is no. A new rebellion centred around Hereward had reared its head. Hereward was based at Ely, and this was an island surrounded by marshland, and it was a most difficult place to attack. And men from all around the kingdom flocked to Ely and Hereward. So the island of Ely was put in a state of defence, knowing that a vengeful king sought their destruction. One significant man who made the journey to Eloy was the Bishop of Durham, Athelswine. And he journeyed there by boat with Seward Barn, an English thane from the north of England, and several hundred others made their way to Eloy. Little was known of Seward's origins, but we do know he enters the historical record around the time of the Danish invasion in 1069. And along with Edgar Atheling, the English Earl Waltheof, and other English leaders, joined the rebellion in conjunction with the Danish invasion. And at this point, Earls Morcar and Edwine, respectively the Earls of Northumbria and Mercia, were still present at William's court, where they had been in situ since 1068. Even though they still held their titles, they exercised very little power, if any at all. So in 1071, 
they made their escape from William's court. The brothers attempted to raise a rebellion, but it was an abject failure. Their absence during the rebellions and subsequent harrying in the north, although not their fault, was a reminder that they could not draw people to their cause any longer. They had lost their power and influence. This is significant as it reminds us that the Anglo-Saxons no longer held any real authority within England. The Normans were willing to fight for England, however, the uprising at Ely had to be dealt with. As fugitives, the brothers went their separate ways. Edwin headed north, attempting to reach Scotland, whereas Morker headed to Ely, ready to continue his fight against William and the Normans. In 1071, William returned to England to counter this new threat. He employed a two-pronged strategy. He used naval forces to blockade the island on its eastern side and deployed an army on its western side. The island of Eli was now under siege, and we have two wildly different accounts of the siege. The jester Herewaldi casts Hereward and his followers in a positive heroic light, but in contrast, the Liber Eliensis states William led an entirely successful attack on the island. And there are other sources, and they all pretty much agree that an English surrender ended the siege, and that was most likely preceded by a successful Norman assault. The king captured many rebels, including Bishop Athelswine, who was taken into custody at Abingdon, where he died not long after. Earl Morcar was also taken captive and died in captivity. We need to revisit Edwin, Morcar's brother. It is most likely that Edwin was killed before the siege. We are told by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that he died in a rising tidal stream whilst attempting to escape from capture. His death and his brother's subsequent capture at Ely meant the last of the major Anglo-Saxon noble families had been dealt a death blow. And others who surrendered to William following the siege were either imprisoned or some were set free, but only once their eyes had been gouged out and their hands chopped off. And the Normans were notorious for not killing their enemies, but rather seriously maiming them instead. And the leader of the rebellion, Hereward, made a daring escape, disappearing into the fens with some of his supporters. Yet still, threats, whether they be tangible or not, continued to exist. Hereward was an outlaw, roaming free. And other rebels from Eli and previous uprisings were still at large. The most obvious was Edgar Atheling. He had roles in multiple rebellions, but he had stayed clear of Eli, where he remained in Scotland. The Scottish King Malcolm III, at the same time as the Siege of Eli, harried into the north of England, going so far as Durham. And Malcolm also cemented his alliance with Edgar by marrying Edgar's sister, Margaret. So this threat may not seem serious to us now, as Edgar had no real support, but hindsight is a wonderful thing, and from William's point of view, this threat had to be dealt with. So William decided to invade Scotland to force Malcolm's hand. So in 1072, he crossed the border with a Norman fleet shadowing the Norman armies marched north. And there they crossed the Firth of Forth and battle was joined with the Scots at Abernethy. The Normans were victorious and King Malcolm was forced to pay homage to William, recognizing the King of the English as his overlord. And the result of this was the Treaty of Abernethy. And let's have a look at what the treaty entailed. Malcolm's son Duncan was given to William as a hostage. This was a way to persuade Malcolm from any further acts of aggression. And Malcolm was also forced to banish Edgar Atheling from the Scottish court. And in return, Malcolm was granted lands in Cumbria, holding them of the English king. So following Edgar Atheling's banishment, it is reported he made his way to Flanders. And as we know, Flanders was already a thorn in the side of William. William's invasion of Scotland was successful. He had forced the Scottish king to once again reaffirm his obedience and recognise the English king as his overlord. And the only contender to the English throne had to flee to the continent, which meant the Anglo-Saxons did not have a figurehead with which to raise a rebellion. And to secure the north, William went even further. He did this by replacing Bishop Athelwine with a Lotharingian named Valka as Bishop of Durham. And the king also ordered the construction of a new castle to be built in Durham next to the cathedral. This not only provided extra security to the cathedral, it further reinforced the fact the Normans had control of both the main pillars of medieval society, that being the church and the secular government, with the cathedral representing the church and the castle representing the overlords, i.e. the Normans. And still the king went further 
he removed Gospatrick as Earl of Northumbria. And Gospatrick had been complicit in the massacre of the Normans in York in 1069. And he had also re rebelled further against William. So Gospatrick fled to Scotland. However, following William's invasion and the Treaty of Abernethy, Malcolm was in no position to provide a safe refuge for any rebellious Englishman. So Gospatrick joined Edgar Atheling in Flanders. And Gospatrick's replacement was a man named Waltheoth. He was a relative of Gospatrick, being a member of House Bamber. And he was also a son of the former Earl of Northumbria, Earl Seward. And Earl Seward was a Danishman and a popular Earl in Northumbria. So choosing Waltheoth as the new Earl was a smart move by William. So Waltheoth was of Danish ancestry, much like most of the Northumbrian population. And he was young. He had also gained his rightful place of Earl, which meant he was most likely not to rock the boat, possibly lose his new position of power. So he seemed just the right person to appoint as Earl of Northumbria. And years earlier, in 1065, Waltheoth was appointed as Earl of Northamptonshire and Huntingdonshire by Edward the Confessor. So Wolfjoth knew what it took to rule an earldom. But we also must know that in 1069, Wolfjoth did involve himself in the rebellion against William. However, William decided to forgive him. And William went so far as to marry Wolfjoth to his niece, Judith of Lenz. And the bond between William and Wolfjoth grew ever stronger. So the North had been somewhat pacified and William felt confident enough to return to Normandy. There was a succession crisis in Flanders, which was the home of William's wife, Judith. So Count Baldwin VI had succeeded Count Baldwin V as the Count of Flanders, and when Baldwin VI died, a conflict erupted between his brother Robert and Baldwin's teenage son, Arnulf, and this culminated in the Battle of Cassel. Arnulf was killed during the battle, as was King William's close friend, William Fitz Osborne. So it turned out the Conqueror had backed the wrong person. And now that Robert was Count of Flanders, Normandy had a hostile neighbour on its eastern border. And to make matters worse, William had lost his long-term friend, William Fitz Osborne. As well as Flanders, William had to contend with a revitalised Anjou under Count Fulk, and also with the new King of France, Philip I, who had recently become King in his own right following his minority. So Count Fulk proceeded to occupy Maine whilst William was in England. In response to this, William led a large English army across the Channel and he reconquered Maine. And in addition to this, King Philip of France married Bertha, who was the sister of Count Robert of Flanders. So it seemed William was surrounded by enemies. However, William was at this point the most fearsome warrior in Europe. He had the military experience his rivals did not possess, and he could also draw upon the resources of the Kingdom of England. So now William spent more time on the continent and had to entrust the governance of England to others and his choice his close friend and spiritual advisor Len Frank. Len Frank was appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury by William in August 1070, a role Len Frank was not enthusiastic about accepting. He had previously been Abbot of Caen in Normandy and this was another post he did not want. But Pope Alexander at the urging of William, commanded Lundfrank to accept the post of Archbishop of Canterbury. So the chief concern of Lundfrank, whilst he was governing England on behalf of William, was the Church. In Anglo-Saxon England, ecclesiastical crimes had been heard in secular courts. But now the Normans were in charge, this was about to change. It was declared by William in 1070 that ecclesiastical laws were not properly administered in England according to the precepts of the Holy Canons. And William further declared that spiritual crimes would now be heard in ecclesiastical courts under Christian law rather than English law. And this meant more administrative work for the church in England. And that meant the appointment of more archdeacons and deputy bishops. And this drastically increased their number in England to unheard of numbers. Another change in the church in England was clerical celibacy. Before the Norman conquest, priests were allowed to have wives and children. But following Lundfrank's accession as Archbishop of Canterbury, he decreed that any priests who were married could keep their wives, but from 1072 onwards, priests were forbidden to be married and must remain celibate. And yet there were more changes. In 1067, Canterbury Cathedral was gutted by fire. And once Lefranc 
was appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury, he ordered it to be rebuilt in the latest Romanesque style. Apart from Westminster Abbey, there was no comparable building in England at the time. So from 1070 onwards, more and more Norman churchmen commissioned grandiose churches and cathedrals. It was clear the Normans had now stamped their authority on the church in England, not just administratively, but aesthetically too. And the seat of bishops had also been moved from villages into cities where it was safer for foreigners. And let's not forget, the majority of the 15 English bishops were now Norman. So it was plain for the people to see the Normans had fully taken over England. The appearance of Norman castles, churches and cathedrals signified Norman power and authority. However, with one of the few Anglo-Saxon bishops now held captive, the House of Leofric, all but extinguished, and the Ely uprising brought to a conclusive end, William and the Normans had well and truly consolidated their power in England. But there were still acts of defiance which the Normans had to contend with. I hope you enjoyed episode 5 of the Bolt Historian podcast. Don't forget to visit my accounts on Facebook and Twitter. I hope you'll join me in episode 6. Until then, goodbye.